But anyway, this morning, I'd like to look at a passage with you, and it's from Luke chapter 15. So if you'd like to look at that passage with me for a moment, um, uh, we're going to be looking at uh, Jesus as the searching shepherd. Jesus as the searching shepherd. In Luke 15, verse 1. As you know, Jesus is constantly having interactions with the preachers of his day. <laughs> and it's, not, it's usually not very uh, good interactions. Uh, they don't like him. He's sort of unorthodox in their view. He's not with it. He's not hanging out at their associa association meetings, their luncheons, and so on. He's actually doing stuff they don't like. They don't think he's playing the game right. They don't think he's in the club. Look at how it starts. Luke 15, 1. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him. And the Pharisees and scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. How dare he? He's not hanging out with us. He's hanging out with those wretched people. Those wretched people. The very people, by the way, who need him. The very people who need him. How do we know this? Jesus knows what's going on. He knows they're grumbling against him. This kind of stuff was public knowledge anyway. I mean, they're doing it in the open. Uh, sometimes we think they're just thinking these things. They're not. They're, they are expressing themselves. Middle Eastern people are expressive people. They say things out loud. They make gestures with their bodies and their faces. This is how they are. So they're not hiding any of this. It's coming out in plain sight for everyone to see. Jesus knows it. And he responds. He actually tells three stories contained in one parable. We're not going to go through all three of them. We're only going to look at the first one. Look at what he says. So he, so he told them this parable. So Jesus instead, instead of giving them a lecture and directly addressing their complaints, he tells a story. He tells a story. It's a great story. Look at it. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. I tell you, these tax collectors and sinners are answering Jesus' call. They're coming to him. They're following after him. They have heard the shepherd's voice. They're responding to him. They know that the shepherd has found them in their lostness. But how terrible must it be for the one who doesn't recognize that he is lost? He doesn't hear the shepherd's voice. He doesn't get it. That would be a terrible position to be in. Far worse than these tax collectors and sinners. And by the way, I've told you this before. Sinners is a nicer euphemism for prostitutes. That's what these people were. Tax collectors and prostitutes. They are the dregs of society. In that culture, in the Jewish culture, they are the worst people. They're at the bottom of the barrel. Tax collectors because they are working with the Roman government. And everybody knows that a tax collector takes more money than he ought to and is cheating everyone. Not only is he working for the invaders, the Romans, but he's ripping off people. Bad, bad stuff there. We don't want anything to do with those tax collectors, right? And prostitutes. You know, prostitution didn't really exist in Israel until the Romans came in. The Romans brought that practice with them, you know. And guess what? They took the people of that land and put them into the service of prostitution. Sometimes we think of prostitutes only as women. 
there were male prostitutes as well back then. And worse still, there were young children who were put into the prostitution service. This is what we're looking at here. This is what the situation is, the reality. They are the ones, however, who are flocking to Jesus. The Pharisees, the preachers of the day, don't like it. They don't like it. This is why preachers have to be so careful. They don't get too big for themselves and think that some people are untouchable. You can't allow that to happen. If you do, you're not following Jesus if that happens. I would say that's not just true for me. It's true for every Christian. If you ever allow yourself to think more highly of yourself than you ought to think, you are no longer walking in the footsteps of Jesus. You're like the Pharisees. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be like those guys. <laughs> I don't want to be like them because those guys don't know, they don't realize how lost they are. That's, that's the situation in this passage. It's interesting that Jesus is not, by the way, the only one, we sometimes think he is, but he's, he wasn't the only one who was teaching this message. Uh, another rabbi that lived in approximately the same time as Jesus said it this way, when a sheep strays from the pasture, who seeks whom? Let me read that again. When a sheep strays from the pasture, who seeks whom? Does the sheep seek the shepherd or the shepherd seek the sheep? To be careful, that's a little tongue twisting. <laughs> Obviously, the shepherd seeks the sheep. In the same way, the Holy One, blessed be he, looks for the lost. That's what Jesus is doing. As he's traveling around, he's seeking the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's what he's doing. The words of this passage and the words I just read to you from that other rabbi teacher of the, of the same time period, their, their messages are about repentance. They're about repentance. Jesus talks about God having joy at repentance. And this other rabbi uh, talks about that even when a person repents, it was ultimately God who brought that about. Because if God was not seeking, no one would be found. We would all remain lost. But it is God, in the person of Jesus, who is the one who is seeking to find the lost. God has mercy on the lost, and he pursues them to bring them back to himself. Now, how did this idea of repentance become linked together with the image of a shepherd finding his sheep? Where did that come from? Is this brand new here? Is it anywhere else in the Bible? Well, it likely came from a very important passage really early in the Bible, and it's at the culmination of the book of Deuteronomy, right after God had given his covenant to the people of Israel, uh, God gave them some warnings at the same time, uh, which are basically you know, terrible things that will happen to Israel if they forsake him. And the worst thing that could happen to them if they did forsake him is that they would be scattered as a people. And it would be like the nation would be dissolved. It would be scattered all over the place. It, but then after that, he makes a promise to them. Now listen to this. This is from Deuteronomy chapter 30. When all these blessings and curses I have set before you come upon you and you take them to heart, wherever the Lord your God disperses you among the nations, and when you and your children return to the Lord your God and obey him with all your heart, and with all your soul, according to everything I commanded you today, then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have compassion on you and gather you again from among the nations where, you, where he scattered you. Even if you have been banished to the most distant land under the heavens, from there the Lord your God will gather you and bring you back. He will bring you to the land that belonged to your fathers and you will take possession of it. 
He will make you more prosperous and numerous than your fathers. Then the Lord your God will circumcise your hearts and the hearts of your descendants so that you may love him with all your heart, with all your soul, and live. There's that idea. You know, it's funny when you read this. I don't know if you've ever thought about this. I remember in the men's Bible study when we were, we've been reading through the Bible. It's taken us a long time, but... Uh, I remember when we read this passage in our Bible study on Saturday morning. It's interesting because this is, this is just before the, the discharge of the people, you know, as they're going to go in, into the promised land, right? That's when this happens. So when it is said to them, but you can see in God's words to them that God is sort of already predicting. He already knows that they're going to fail to keep, live up to the covenant. He says, you're going to get scattered among the nations. It's going to happen. I see it coming because you're a stick neck, stiff neck people. <laughs> it says this to them. And we are, are we not? We're stubborn people. We think we know more than we do. And we make mistakes all the time. God knows this. But did you notice the emphasis on mercy in that passage I just read? God still is going to extend mercy. He is still going to remain faithful. He's going to seek out his people, even when they've been scattered, and bring them back into his fold and take care of them. That's a merciful God. That's what a shepherd would do. The shepherd scatters the sheep. They're scattered around. Then he calls them, brings them back into the fold so he can take care of them. And the hope, the promise here is that there will be this time when God will circumcise our hearts and the hearts of the descendants that they may love him with all your heart. That's all God has ever really wanted, isn't it? He loves us and he wants us to love him back with our hearts, with all our hearts. But we fail to do that. How do we know we fail to do that? Because we don't put him first. That's why. That's, that's a big indicator that we don't love him completely like we ought to. Now, people understood that that promise that I just read from Deuteronomy 30 was not just one of being brought back together physically into the land, but more importantly, that God would bring them back to himself. And this is a, more of a spiritual thing, even though when we use the word spiritual, sometimes I'm not sure what that's communicating. But at the very least, I think... What it's communicating is that God is bringing them back into a proper relationship with himself. That's what I think the word spiritual means here. Uh, it may mean something different to you, but I think that's what God really wants. He wants us to be in a proper relationship with him. He's always related to us, but we're not always related to him in the right way. This is why he's always off out there searching for us trying to bring us back into this fold, to restore the relationship, to rest in that restoring of that relationship that he wants to have with us. I read this passage earlier. Let me read it to you once more. This is God's heart from Jeremiah 31. Hear the word of the Lord, O nations. You hear that, O nations? This, is, this isn't just for the Jewish nation. Hear the word of the Lord, O nations. Okay? Sometimes that word's translated Gentiles in the Bible. But guess what? That's us too. Hear the word of the Lord, O nations. Proclaim it in the distant coastlands. He who scattered Israel will gather them and will watch over his flock like a shepherd. There's that idea. The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah. And it will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers. That's the one I was reading about in Deuteronomy 30. It will not be like that one. When I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God. They will be my people. 
No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, because I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. That new covenant Jesus brought with him. And he says that. You know, if if I'd have been thinking clearly (laughs) this week, which I wasn't, We'd have had communion today. It's the first Sunday of the month. And this message would fit nicely with communion, wouldn't it? When Jesus takes that cup, and he says, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. That's, he's talking about Jeremiah 31. That's what he's talking about. This is a new covenant. No one's going to be able to say anymore, teach his neighbor or teach his brother saying no Lord because they will all know me from the least of these to the greatest how did God make that possible that we could know him like that how did he do that two things possibly more but two things I'm thinking of right now that he did number one he showed us exactly what he's like by coming in the flesh in the person of Jesus right what better way can you know what God is like than when God comes down to us and shows us in human flesh what he's like? This is why we talk about the importance of being a follower of Jesus, is it not? We have to be a follower of him because he showed us the way. He showed us the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me, he said. Secondly, he made it possible for God to forgive wickedness to forgive sins so that God will not remember our sins anymore he made that possible by dying for our sins on the cross that enables God to be able to say I will remember your sins no more because my son has taken your sins upon himself he's become the cursed when you are the cursed he has taken that away from you and he's given you His very righteousness. Now that, to me, is absolutely amazing. I hope it is to you too. What Jesus accomplished for us is that he took our wretchedness, our wickedness upon himself. And by faith in him, he applies his own righteousness to us so that God can accept us. That's huge. It's big news. Great news. I hope it's true of you. I hope it's true of you that you have accepted that. He is the shepherd that has come. You know, sometimes we feel like we're lost when we're not. Sometimes we feel like we wandered off somehow and we don't know where God is. Where is God? This happens a lot of times when we go through difficult circumstances in our lives. Um, I I know it it can happen a lot of times when we lose a loved one, um, when we feel empty and lonely. We feel like God is distant. Um, You know, when I was a little boy, I was five years old. Um, My brother and I, Jonathan and I, Jonathan was three, I was five. Our brother, Kevin, died in a drowning accident. And I remember when it happened, even though it happened so long ago, uh, we couldn't find him. He had disappeared. We, I grew up in Florida, and there's a lake out front. And there's a swamp on, the, on one side of our house and the lake out front. And my brother Kevin was about two years old. He had just learned how to walk and was getting around on his own. He figured out how to open the door, and he got out. We couldn't find him. He le- left the house. I remember my dad coming up to my brother and I and saying, we can't find your brother. Can you guys go for a walk around the block and look for him? And we did. Came back when we circled back around. I saw the deputy sheriff car and the ambulance in our driveway. I didn't know what had happened, but they, my dad had found him in the swamp. He had drowned in the swamp. It took my mom, I don't think she's really ever gotten over it. It took her a long time. I, I, one thing I remember, this is, this is the loneliness that comes with this kind of event, is they took my brother and I away. My aunt and uncle took us away. We were brought back later that evening. 
because my mom said, I want my boys here. I can't stand an empty house. I have to have them here. That, that sense of loneliness can make you feel lost, can't it? I, I think that sense is captured better than anyone else in C.S. Lewis's book, A Grief Observed. If you haven't read that, I would highly recommend you read it. Now, it was written back a long time ago in the, like 1961 or something like 60 or 61 when his wife died of cancer. And he is very honest. and open. It's basically a journal that he kept, that he wrote during that time, where he just openly expressed his feelings. And that's exactly what happens to us, is it not our passions, our feelings can sometimes blind us to the reality that God is still present, even though we don't feel like he is. We don't feel like he is. Lewis is struggling with this. And the, the great thing about this book is that you can see the depths of despair that he plunges into in the early part of the book. And then you can see him slowly climbing out of it. And he starts to think again. He starts to realize, once again, that God is not as distant as he felt that he was. This is how he puts it. He, he's, he's writing, he, I'm, I'm kind of taking this out of a larger context, so bear with me. He says, when your need is desperate, go to God, when all other help is vain. And what do you find? A door slammed in your face, and a sound of bolting and double bolting on the inside after that. Silence. You may as well turn away. The longer you wait, the more emphatic the silence will become. There are no lights in the windows. It might be an empty house. Was it ever inhabited? It seemed so once. And that seeming was as strong as this. What can this mean? Why is he so present, a commander in a time of prosperity, and so very absent, a help? in time of trouble. He's writing this when he's grieving, when he's in this emotional bondage. He's overwhelmed. He's overwhelmed with passions. He comes out of it eventually. And he writes this. I've gradually been coming to feel that the door is no longer shut and bolted. Was it my own frantic need that slammed the door in my face? The time when there is nothing at all in your soul except a cry for help may be just the time when God can't give it. You are like the drowning man who can't be helped because he clutches and grabs. Perhaps your own reiterated cries deafen you to the voice you hope to hear. When I lay these questions before God, I get no answer, but rather a special sort of no answer, he writes. It's not the locked door. It is more like a silent, certainly not uncompassionate gaze, as though he shook his head, not in refusal, but waving the question, like, peace, child, you don't understand. Can a mortal ask questions which God finds unanswerable? Quite easily, I should think. All nonsense questions are unanswerable, he says. How many hours are there in a mile? Is yellow square or round? Probably half the questions we ask. Half of our greatest theological and mystical problems are like that. It's just amazing how he puts this together. I, I think it's perfect. He's, he's capturing those feelings that you go through, that we all have gone through or will go through if we haven't yet, when we suffer loss, when we feel like we're lost. We feel like the door's been slammed in our face and the bolts have been locked, as he so well states it here. But then he kind of comes to his senses later and he realizes it was not I who closed the door. It was not God who closed the door. It was I who closed the door. I was keeping God from being able to help me. 
like a drowning man whose grasping and clawing keeps the rescuer from being able to pull him out of the water. For fear he will pull him down with him, obviously. Sometimes we feel like we're lost because the emotions are swarming us. But God is not absent in those times. He is still there. And we can't hear him because the passions are ringing in our ears so much we're unable to hear his voice. But he's there, nonetheless. He's there. It takes time. It takes time. When a, you never go and try to give a theological discourse to a grieving person. It's a wrong thing to do. I remember Tim Holland used to say that. Uh, he used to say, the best thing to do is just sit with him. Just be with him. Just be with him. God's presence will be revealed to them eventually as the emotions begin to temper. You will once again realize that you're not lost, that God is there. He's there. Remember Jesus on the cross. What does he say? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's quoting from Psalm 22, I believe, or Psalm 2. God heard his cry. If you go and continue to read that psalm, God saved him from death by raising him from the dead. You and I, my friends, have a God who is not absent. He does not have a deaf ear to our cries. We just have to attune ourselves to hear, to hear his voice. And he will rescue us if we will listen. The person who does not know that they're lost is the person for whom we should have the most pity. The Apostle Paul describes that person in Philippians chapter 3. And it's not a pleasant picture. This is what he writes. He writes, Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you, with even tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. And they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. That is the person who's lost and doesn't know it. That's the person who will end in destruction. And it's a terrible thing. It's a terrible thing to, to be in that position. Don't allow yourself to be in that position. And you probably know people who are. They just don't hear the voice of God. They don't hear the shepherd calling out to them. What are we supposed to do? We are to keep our eyes on those who we are to walk in accordance with as, as examples to us. Primarily, of course, we're talking about Christ and those who follow Christ. He says, but our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. We have a God, we have a shepherd who cares for us, who has sought us out, has found us, has found us, and we are his sheep. Isn't that great news? It's great news. Reach out to those people who are in need of him as their shepherd. Be an example to them. Show them, show them what the walk looks like. Show them what the Savior looks like. That's all we can do for them. Pray for them, lift them up, and show them what it means to be a follower of the great shepherd. Let's pray.